We have here an author, but also a former manager of some of the biggest acts of the last 25, 30 years. Most of them aren't that relevant to electronic music. Some of them are, but his story and his experiences in the industry and his experiences in Asia in particular really caught my attention when I read a book of his, uh, Black Vinyl, White Powder, was the very powerful name of it. It's an incredible read and it, it really digs the dirt on a lot of what really goes on in the industry. And for this conference, I think what really interested us was his work in bringing the first Western act to play in communist China. And that was but the band Wham, which I'm sure most of you know. So um, I'd like to introduce Simon Napier-Bell for a very special keynote. Thank you. Hi. Well, you're going to get 25 minutes with no EDM at all now, but a little bit of experience of Asia. Um, just so you know, I, I, in the 60s, I managed the Yardbirds, Jeff Beck, Jimmy Page, uh, Mark Boland, Tyrannosaurus Rex, T-Rex. I wrote some songs. I had a hit with You Don't Have to Say You Love Me. I produced quite a lot of records with uh, the Peter Sarsted, Robin Sarsted, with the Scaffold, who were a group who had Paul McCartney's brother in. Uh, did quite a lot of things, but by the 70s, I was getting a little bored with it. And uh, one day in 1970, I went to see my good friend, Kit Lambert, who is the manager of The Who. He lived in a rather magnificent house in Egerton Terrace in London. And this was April, and there was beautiful cherry blossom trees on both sides of the road, all in bloom. And uh, when he came to the door, I said to him, Kit, you know, the cherry blossoms looking absolutely amazing. And Kit was rather posh and very supercilious. And he said, oh, my dear boy, he said, you hadn't really seen cherry blossom until you seen it in Japan. So I said, oh, well, fuck you. I won't have coffee. And I went to the airport and got in a plane and flew to Tokyo. I am quite impetuous like that. Um, and so the next morning, I got off the plane in Haneda Airport. That was the only international airport in Tokyo in those days, right in the middle of town. An amazing place to have an airport. Uh, booked a hotel at the desk in the airport and got a cab into town. As I came out of the airport, the first thing I saw, a motorbike pass by. It was a Harley Davidson, and sitting side saddle on the pillion uh, was a Buddhist monk in saffron robes with a crash helmet. And I thought, yes, this really is, this is imagery I've never seen in, in Europe before. Uh, this is a new place. And then when I reached the hotel, which is the new Ot Otani, which then was the, the biggest and newest and best hotel in Tokyo, um, I walked into the lobby and, and it confirmed all, all of what I thought Asia was about. You know, in Japan, uh, it's normally when a foreign businessman comes to Japan, uh, companies don't like the, the businessman to come to their offices. They usually work in big open plan offices, so even a quite highly placed executive in a Japanese company doesn't have his own office, and they're embarrassed by that. So they always go to the hotel and meet their, their foreign business counterparts in the hotel. So when I walked into this lobby, there was this huge, it was like a sort of five-star equivalent of a tropical market, this huge, massive buzz, little... Hundreds of tables with Japanese businessmen and sitting listening to their, their foreign counterparts being served by petite little waitresses and waiters in, in dinner jackets and bow ties, you know, smiling ties and silk-shirted Filipinos and clove cigarette-smoking Indonesians, uh, Malaysian businessmen with their little Islamic caps on. Um, I was completely entranced by this and hooked on Asia in one second. And I stayed for a year uh, with guidebooks and history books and phrase books. I, went all over Asia. So by the end of 1970, I'd spent a year in Southeast Asia and ended up, in fact, for six months in Indonesia where uh, I met lots of top record producers and artists and actually wrote songs and produced records there. But eventually the money ran out. I had to come back to England and work. Uh, and I didn't get back to Asia for three or four years. And a couple of years after I came back, I signed a group in the UK called Japan. Now, Japan were an amazing looking group. It'd be difficult to see them uh, without thinking, this is a group you just had to sign. They were beautiful, they had blonde hair, they wore a little makeup, and they made very, very interesting, quite complex rock music. Uh, wonderful, and with brilliant lyrics. The lead singer, David Sullivan, wrote extraordinary lyrics. Um, and I didn't know, because I'd been away, that while I'd been away, that punk had taken over, and that Wham! were completely out of their moment. It wasn't the right music, it wasn't the right look, nothing about them was right. They didn't seem to know it either. Um, but two years without getting them a record deal, I realized that I'd made quite a mistake. Unfortunately, that two years was costing me. I was probably 50 or 60,000 pounds in the hole. And eventually, I got them a deal with a German record company, Hansa, who'd come to London to set up in UK, uh, who also were unaware that Japan were completely out of their moment. Um, and they were very good. They put a lot of promotion into it. They made an album, a very good album. They put a lot of promotion into it, spent money, did advertising, 
and still nothing happened. So I had the idea, but perhaps because they were called Japan, if I went to Japan, the name would, would, would trigger some interest. And I looked at Japanese pop magazines and teen magazines, and I found that Japanese kids, they, they really don't very much like, uh, they didn't very much like the, the look of heavy Western artists, punk or rock. It was just too much for them. And nearly all the Western artists were popular in Japan, in fact, had the same look as my group Japan. There was soft looking, blonde hair, little makeup. There was an American kid called Leif Garrett who was popular at the time. Cliff Richard had been popular. So I thought, there's a chance there. Maybe I could break Japan down. I didn't rush, though. I, I first I enrolled at the Japanese Institute in Beaconsfield and went every morning for three hours, starting at 6 a.m. every morning, to learn Japanese and Japanese culture. And armed with that little, little bit of Japanese I learned, three months later, I went to Tokyo and met the company who would be the licensee for Japan if they were to take the, take the record, Toshiba EMI. They loved the image. I had thought they would. Absolutely loved it. Fell in love with it. So it's the best image they've ever seen on a Western group. But they hated the music. And I sort of knew they'd hate the music too, because that's the problem we had in the UK. It wasn't suitable for the moment. Um, and I accepted it. I said, well, thank you very much for seeing me. And I got up to leave. But I remembered when I'd been studying at this for three months at the Japanese Institute, uh, they also taught me a lot about Japanese culture, that Japanese... Is a, Japan is a totally consensual society. Actually, not just Japan, but most of Southeast Asia, in fact, any country which has uh, Buddhism as its, its sort of background religion, it doesn't matter if it's now, but not a Buddhist country like Japan or China isn't, but that is the, the background of their own culture. And they really believe in consensualism. And when I got up to leave, what I was doing, I was being very rude to them because they, it made them look as if they'd really pushed me to leave by not liking the music. They said, no, 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 just sit down. Said, we really don't like the music. Now, if a Western record company said that, an American or English company said that, they'd be saying to you, look, go and make some more records. Come back when you make another record. No, they didn't mean that at all. They said, we don't like the music. We're going to have to sell them strictly with the image. So I said, what about the music? Well, we'll come later. Let's start with the image. And so we devised a plan, and for the next six months, we worked totally with photographs and, and uh, interviews. I went back to London, I supplied them with everything they wanted. And at the end of six months, we had a 30,000 fan club. In fact, at the end of six months, Japan were the most popular non-Japanese group in Japan. And then the record was released, and there were 30,000 members of the fan club. And by midday on the very first day of the record release, we had sold 30,000 records in three hours. It doesn't sound so amazing nowadays with electronic means of buying, but in those days it was staggering. Um, by 6 p.m., 30,000 teenage fans were disappointed, sitting at home listening to music they didn't understand, didn't much like, was nothing they'd ever heard of in relation to groups who looked like this. But they were already in love. They were fans, and they'd bought the album. Um, and so they listened to it. And by the end of a week, they'd got to like it. And um, three months or three weeks later, in fact, Japan came, Japan, the group, came to Japan, the country, and played their first gig there. At the Budokan, 12,000 screaming teenage fans. The biggest gig they had ever played before coming to play at the Budokan for 12,000 fans was at the Red Lion in Hammersmith for 80 people. It was, it was quite a culture shock for them. Um, we still didn't break in England, but for the next three years, while we worked on a strategy to break the group in Europe and England, we came every year to Japan for three to four weeks uh, and earned enough money to live each year until finally, three or four years later, we did break the group in England. In fact, they became probably the most influential rock group of the early 80s in the UK and in Europe. But unfortunately, they then broke up. Uh, it was pretty inevitable. The, the bass player's girlfriend, Mick Khan, the bass player, his girlfriend, moved in with the singer. And uh, that's pretty difficult to keep a group together once that happens. And having been through all this and pulled this off and made the thing happen after all these difficulties, I was a bit pissed off. And I thought, the time has come. I'm going to go and live in Asia. I love Asia. I'll go and write books in Asia. And the day before I was due to go, there was a ring at the door, and a guy was there. He was called Jazz Summers, and he was another manager. And he hadn't had quite my experience. He started 10 years later than me. Uh, but he, he had his idea. He had a few ideas. And he said, if he came into partnership with me, we'd be hugely successful. He would do all the work. He'd, I wouldn't have to do any work. He'd do it all. He just needed my name to help him. And um, 
I explained that that really wouldn't work. If I, if I did go into partnership, we'd have to split the work. But I, he rather appealed to me. He couldn't have been more different from me. He was absolutely the opposite of everything I was. He was extremely confrontational, whereas I like to be circumspect and not confront people. Um, he was slightly spoke with an aggressive working class accent. And everything about him was different, but I felt we'd be a good partnership. So we agreed we'd do this. And we listed, we couldn't be bothered to break a group. We'd done all that. And it's a waste of time. Two years wasting time breaking. We'd find a group which is already broken. And we wrote down a list. Uh, there was the Eurythmics and uh, Culture Club and ABC and Wham. And we looked at them and thought, which of these groups could we get hold of? And we found out Wham didn't actually have a manager at the time. They were being looked after by their lawyer. So we chased after them, and eventually we got hold of them, and we agreed to have a dinner together and talk with them. And we had dinner at the Bombay Brasserie in South Kensington in London, a rather high-class Indian restaurant. And within minutes of being in there, George fixed a steely eye on us and said, we want to be the biggest group in the world, and you've got one year. Well, I said, it's impossible. The biggest group in the world has to be the biggest group in America, too. And you cannot break America in a year. The way you do it is you have to work first to get a hit record. When you've got a hit record, you have to go over there and tour in maybe two or three hundred seater venues, six, seven, eight cities. Then you go back and tour the same cities again in 600 seater venues. Then go a slightly bigger and longer tour and bigger venues. It takes at least three to four years, usually five. Well, he said, up to you, you've got a year. And I think it was at that point that Jazz said to me, I've got an idea. Why not be the first? Western rock or pop group ever to play in communist China. And George said, yep, I like that, do that. And um, I liked it too, because I wanted to go to Asia. So Jazz stayed behind in England and managed the group. And three days later, I was on a plane to Beijing. Well, not really to Beijing, because I'd found out I couldn't get a visa. Uh, a visa took at least three months, and you had to have a formal invitation from the government or a private organization sorted by the government. But I'd heard from somebody that if I went to Hong Kong, and I went to see this chap who had a little shop down the lane and went up five flights, um, and I could pay him $500. He'd give me a little something I put in my passport, and when I arrived at the airport, if I went to the right gate and winked at the right man and gave him my passport, um, providing he was on duty, because if he wasn't, I'd be arrested, uh, I'd probably get in the country. And I did. And I was told to take a taxi at once and go to the Holiday Inn, which is the only hotel in Beijing for Westerners, the only hotel in Beijing which Western businessmen alone in Beijing were allowed to go and stay at. So I went there, and it was January. And it was freezing. I mean, it was like um, about, about 10 below zero with a wind chill of another 20 degrees below zero. And the Holiday Inn had been built there to cheat, save money. They'd built the Holiday Inn by copying the plan of the Holiday Inn, uh, which was built in some tropical island somewhere. And uh, so the, the corridors were open. They didn't have indoor corridors. You had to walk to your room from the outside, you know, in minus 30 degrees. You had to buy, I had to buy an overcoat in the lobby in order to go to my room. Um, so I sat in this room and wondered what the hell I'd got into. And I had the idea to call the, the British Embassy. And the British Embassy sent me around by bike a book listing all the ministries in Beijing and the names of all the ministers and the phone numbers. So I sat in the room for two days and I found every single ministry and tried in each one to find someone who spoke English. Uh, it, sometimes it was just the cleaner, but if I found someone who spoke English, I said to them, tell the minister Simon Napier Bell has come to take him to lunch. And that's the only thing I could think of to do. I mean, how do you arrive in a country the size of China, the country even if it's the size of Taipei, uh, and get to see the head of state and say, seriously, could my pop group come and play? It was the dumbest thing I'd ever done, and two days was enough, and so I came back home. Well, I didn't come straight back home. I discovered that Pan Am Airways, which flew right around the world in those days, had a first-class round-the-world ticket. Pan Am flew to New York, Los Angeles, Hawaii, Tokyo, Hong Kong, Singapore, Bangkok, Delhi, Frankfurt, London, and around again. And so I bought one of these every month, and I actually flew from London to Bangkok. I spent four days on the beach. Uh, and then I'd fly to Beijing for two days and spend two days making these phone calls, etc. And then I spent four days on, on the beach in Acapulco. And I'd come back home and I'd say to Jazz, you know, oh, two weeks in Beijing, it's such hell. He said, oh, you poor chap, take a week's holiday. Um, now, I did this for 13 months. But let me tell you, on my second trip, I went back a month later, checked in the Holiday Inn, and I had my first taker. There was a message from the Minister of Energy. He was coming to see me. Why the Minister of Energy wanted to come to see me, I had no idea, but he obviously wanted a lunch. 
And he arrived. Now, I've got to tell you, in those days, Beijing, if you know Beijing now, it's nothing like Beijing now. Beijing was four stories high, long, straight, red brick and concrete buildings, like bunkers, with just huge wide roads in between, ten lanes, five in each direction, not a single car on the whole of Beijing. And for two hours in the morning, two hours in the evening, the roads were stuffed with bicycles. Every single person in China wore a Chairman Mao suit, girls, guys. Women couldn't wear makeup, and you were not allowed to talk to foreigners. If I went on the street, people ran away from me because they were afraid of getting arrested. So um, the Minister of Energy turned up in his Chairman Mao suit and walked into the lobby with his bicycle clips on, pulling him off as he came. If you think of what the Minister of Energy would be in America or UK, it was quite extraordinary. And he said, very, very pleased to meet you. He said, um, pleased to hear you want to buy coal from Jiangxi. And I said, well, that's not, not really why I'm here. Oh, he said, he got me muddled up with a man from Norway who wanted to buy a lot of coal. But I didn't want to be churlish, so I said, well, you've come anyway, I'll buy you lunch. And he spoke very good English, and he said, what are you here for? And I said, well, I'm in the music business, and I just sort of thought it'd be nice to talk to people about music and England and culture and things like this. And I thought the best way maybe would be to suggest people come to lunch. He said, oh, it's a fantastic idea, because the food in Beijing is absolutely dreadful, he said lowering his voice, he said, 10 years of collecting, 20 years of collective farming have made the produce so bad it's not edible, and all the good chefs have left and gone to the West. Uh, and if you, this is the one good restaurant in the whole of Beijing, because it's a Western hotel, they import the food and they have a Hong Kong chef. And if you invite people to lunch here, they'll come. And he said, next month when you come back, I'll bring a few more friends. And next week he bought three ministers and their interpreters, lunch for six. And one of the things I'd learned when I was doing that deal with Japan in Japan, for the group Japan in Japan, was that another part of this sort of Buddhist-derived Asian culture is that to ask the question, any question which demands a yes or no answer, is basically very confrontational. Uh, Asian people don't like to think in yes or no terms. They like to think more circumspectly. Uh, they like gray areas rather than black or white areas. And so I decided that the way to do this was really not to ask a yes or no question. And the other thing which is absolutely tantamount to doing business in Asia is, is you can't just arrive and do business with somebody. People have to know who you are. They have to get to know you. So if you're thinking of flying over here for two days, doing a deal, going home, fantastic triumphant, I've got the money, got the check, it's not going to happen. You have to come over here on your first trip. You need to meet the people you think you might do business with buy them a dinner, allow them to buy you a dinner back. Now you're friends, now you can come back next time and suggest a few things. Um, so th this process was going rather well. I'd now got three ministers and three interpreters. We had lunch for six, it was very good. And I dropped into the lunch. I said, you know, it'd be really nice one day if, uh, if a Western popular music group, like a youth culture group, was to come and play in China. And I said, well, what would be really good is because if a Western group came and played, um, the whole world would think you're opening up because that's what the world judges things by. Are you prepared to accept Western youth groups? And, um, and then your investment, foreign investment would come pouring in. You'd do incredibly well. All these buildings would finally get built and you'd have all the money you need. And to be honest, we couldn't care less if nobody in China knows a thing about it. All I want is the publicity outside of China because it will help make my group bigger. But there was one man at the lunch. He was the Minister of Employment. And he said, oh, this is a very bad idea. He said, if a if Western group comes in place in China, he says, this will put all the musicians in China out of work. And I said, you must have a million musicians in China. There's two people coming to play one concert. I don't think it's going to put many people out of work. In fact, I said, we found that when a popular group goes and plays in a country where it hasn't been exposed before, it really encourages lots of young people to learn music and take up music, which would be really good. He said, no, that would be really bad. He said, then we have too many musicians. So um, I realized in this very state-controlled country, it's best to keep my mouth shut. So I continued with lunches, coming each month, adding a little bit more to what I was saying. On the third visit, I said, you know, I mentioned about a, a Western pop group coming and playing in China one day. I mean, actually, I didn't tell you, but I actually manage a Western pop group. That's enough. That's enough. More prawns, minister. And um, the next month, I went a little further and said, you know, that group I manage, you know, if they did come one day, they're called Wham, by the way. That's enough. We went on. They, they really like drunken prawns. Drunken prawns are when you bring a large bowl of live prawns and 
the waiter comes and pours a lot of brandy in and the prawns all start drinking. They get very happy. They jump. Oh, lads, this is lovely. We're getting drunk. And then just when they're at their happiest, the waiter comes and throws a match in and shoves a lid on and they all burn to death and, and, and taste incredibly delicious. And the ministers like this dish. We often had it two or three times at one lunch. Anyway, this went on and by the fifth or sixth lunch, we were getting 10, 12 ministers, half the cabinet. I mean, these are the people who ruled the, second, the biggest country in the world, the second biggest economy in the world, and I was having lunch with them all every month. Um, and then on the seventh or eighth visit, I, I heard some bad news. I heard that another group was trying to edge their way into China. I heard the Queen had been making you know, little tentative uh, talks with people to see if they get into China. So my next visit back to London, I, pre I preferred, prepared two nice dossiers, very beautifully presented. Uh, there was a large book on Wham, and it showed Wham, these lovely two young, uh, nice middle-class guys uh, who loved their mum and dad and bought them presents on Mother's Day and Father's Day, and at weekends went to Sainsbury's and Tesco's to help old women carry their shopping home. <laughs> and then there was a, a folio on Queen, and it had a picture, I found a Freddie Mercury at a Christmas party in full drag. And un underneath it had the quotation from the Oxford Dictionary, one of the uh, definitions, you know, queen, a homosexual, a man who dresses in women's clothing and wears makeup. And I presented his two dossiers, so that was queen out of the way, and it was back to wham only. And um, anyway, this went on till we got to the 13th lunch. And at the 13th lunch, I now had three quarters of the cabinet. There's only about three ministers I didn't have, plus the two prime ministers. There were two prime ministers in China at the time, Li Peng and Xiao Ziyang. I had met them. They'd, they'd come along one time just to say hello, because they were a bit worried where all the ministers disappeared on, uh, once a month. And they, they didn't join the lunch, but they said hello to me. Um, but of course, the only man in China who could say yes would be Deng Xiaoping, the, the, the president of China. But on this 13th lunch, at the end of lunch, one of the interpreters said to me, the Minister of Culture would like to see you. Now, the Minister of Culture in China is hugely important. Culture is one of the top three ministries. So this was a real breakthrough. And, um, and these interpreters, by the way, who came to lunch, they were far more important than the ministers. These interpreters were all secret police, and um, they were there to make sure the ministers didn't say the wrong thing and report back on them. Um, and it took a while for me to realize that it was really the interpreters I was talking to. Anyway, he took me off to see the Minister of Culture. And on the Minister of Culture's desk was a red telephone. And a red telephone only went to one place. It went to the President of China, Zheng uh, Xiaoping. And in, after talking to me for a few minutes, nice it is, hello, how are you? Very good, I hear you've been feeding all my colleagues good lunch. Can I come to the next one, that sort of thing? He picked up the phone and spoke. Uh, for all my 13 months going there, I hadn't learned any Chinese, but I knew he could only be speaking to one person. And when he put the phone down, he said, your group is invited to China. And uh, I said, that's very nice. And, um, and then, because I still didn't really want to ask a yes or no question, like, are you sure? I mean, you know, I said, so um, that'd be very nice. So they can come and they, maybe they could play in the, the Workers' Stadium, which is a nice stadium halfway into town maybe April the 7th, he's, yeah, okay, okay. And I really wasn't quite sure. I was so unsure if this was, because he didn't give me a paper, he didn't w have trumpets blown and wave a banner, he just said that was it. I was so unsure that I flew to Singapore and called Jazz in London and said, we've been invited, we need to inv in announce it to the world's press at once. Because I felt if it was in the papers the next day, Wham! playing in China, everywhere in the world, the Chinese wouldn't withdraw from it because they did want this foreign investment and they'd fallen for that argument I'd made. And once announced to say, oh, we changed our minds, it would definitely harm them economically. So the next day, every paper in the world, literally every newspaper had front page news, Wham! to play in China. Then I went back to London. We had one immediate problem. We did a budget. There was nothing in China you could use. There weren't even good spotlights. There weren't, it wasn't even fused well. We were going to have to take every last thing with us, plus our crew, plus a lot of people wanted to come with us, family and friends. Uh, we realized we had to hire a jumbo just for freight. And we did the budget, and it came to half a million pounds, which we didn't actually have sitting in the bank, unsurprisingly. So I called CBS and got through to the head of CBS Records, which is Wham's record company, 
to Paul Russell. And Paul, I said, I've pulled it off. We're going to play in China. There's one little problem. I'm sure you can help. But we need half a million pounds. And he said, wow, when? And I said, well, tomorrow. And um, he said, come in at midday. The check will be on the desk, which is unbelievable. So Paul Russell, thank you. You're the, a, a, an amazing man amongst record executives. But then he called back. Sorry, he said, I made a bit of a mistake with that. We, I've talked to other people, we can't do it after all, unless there's a video. There has to be a full video of the whole thing or we can't do it. So I sat down with Jazz for another two hours and we called a few people and eventually we got Lindsay Anderson, who was a world-class filmmaker, to agree he'd come and do it. And he wanted to do it with three camera crews, three sound crews. We rebudgeted and it was now double, a, bil a million. And I called back Paul Russell and said, Paul, done, film crew on, could you just up the check a little bit, you know, maybe a million. And yes, he did. The next day it was there on the desk, and we went to China. But let me tell you, and you probably all know if you've done business with China, um, it costs you a lot. We were invited to a state banquet. Both the prime ministers came, all the whole cabinet came, all the ministers, 800 people came. We paid. We paid for the people who sat in the ticket office and sold the tickets. The money from the tickets went to the Chinese government for charities. Absolutely everything we had to pay for. And there was one further little problem, is that we had told the Western press when they asked why were well, I invited, we said it's because they're the biggest group in China, everybody loves them, kids all sing the songs. And of course, not one single person in China had ever heard of Wham or knew any of the songs. So we made a cassette, which was all of Wham songs on one side, and on the other side, all the same songs sung in Mandarin by a well-known Mandarin singer. And with each ticket, we gave away a cassette, so the kids who came to the concert would know the songs in advance. In fact, we gave two cassettes, so they could sell one cassette to pay for the ticket and still have one to learn the songs from. Um, and so that's what happened. And when the concert took place, there were 90 camera TV crews from around the world, 90. The entire front half of the downstairs of the stadium was TV crews, journalists, and photographers. And for one week, they were on the front page of NBC, they were on news, TV news in America on NBC, CBS, ABC, for a whole seven days, they were on front page of Time, front page of Newsweek, and five weeks later, we booked a stadium tour in America. It wasn't one year, as George said, it was two years, but it was still quite good. Thank you.